morning. This hearing is called to order. This is a public hearing of the Commerce Economic Development Committee on bills number 140829 and 140860. My name is W. Wilson Good Jr., Chair of the Committee. I note that a quorum is present. Uh, to my left is Majority Leader Curtis Jones. To my right is Councilman Janie Blackwell. And to her right is Vice Chair of the Committee, uh, Councilman Mark Squiller. The title of bill number 140829, amending Section 18201 of the Philadelphia Code entitled Leases of Airport Facilities by Requiring Ground Handling Service <laughs> Providers Under Services Contracts with Air Carriers, including subcontractors providing such services who are operating in Philadelphia International Airport to secure labor peace agreements to minimize the risk of service disruptions and lost revenue to the city generated from employments. The title of Bill Number 140860, establishing a new chapter 17. 2200 of the Philadelphia Code entitled Labor Peace Agreements for Hotel Workers where the City has a financial interest by requiring a labor agreement to protect the City's proprietary interest in hotel operations which lease property from the City or are financed with City assistance, all to certain terms and conditions. Our first witness today on Bill 829 uh, will be Bianca Augustine and also James Runkle. That's our first panel. Mr. Runkle. Good morning. Please identify yourself for the record. Sure. Uh, I'm James Runkle uh, from Spear Wilderman. Uh, I'm counsel to uh, SEIU Local 32 BJ, uh, as well as some other labor organizations you're familiar with, like, like the gas workers. Um, so um, I'm here today to basically uh, talk about um, the preemption argument. And I'm not going to bore you with the lecture on preemption law. But I know there was a, uh, a memorandum submitted by the uh, City Law Department on preemption. So uh, I'm here to basically tell you that uh, based on the, on the case law that exists, uh, this ordinance is fine. This ordinance is not preempted by federal labor law. Um, the city solicitors, uh, one of the city, deputy city solicitors memorandum said it might be, it might not be. Well, it's not. So I'm just going to briefly tell you, tell you why. Um, the case cited most frequently by the, uh, the city law department is, is a case that precedes the Supreme Court's case called Boston Harbor. Uh, in Boston Harbor, the Supreme Court was dealing with uh, an agency for the Boston government that was, that was tasked with cleaning up the Boston Harbor very quickly. And what they did is they mandated a, actually a collective bargaining agreement with a 10-year no-strike clause to make sure that the Boston Harbor was cleaned up in, a, in an efficient, effective way with no disruptions. And what the Supreme Court says is that that kind of deal was not preempted by a case called Garmin by federal labor law because the agency had a proprietary interest in ensuring that this was accomplished without disruption because of the revenue stream. So there was no preemption there. And that's the Supreme Court. The U.S. Supreme Court set that forth. Um, in this circuit, the Third Circuit Court of Appeals, um, the, the circuit has set out a two-pronged test in a case called Sage Hospitality. And the question is, legally, does this ordinance meet that two-pronged test? And the first test is, is it proprietary in nature? You're protecting your revenue stream, just like any private entity in the marketplace would, versus you're regulating federal labor law. You're intruding into federal labor law and saying what can and can't happen when that's reserved to the NLRA, the NLRB. Um, that's the first prong. The second prong is, is the ordinance strictly tailored to that proprietary interest of protecting the revenue stream? That's the test in this circuit. Other cases, district court cases cited in California 15 years ago don't matter. This is the Third Circuit, and that's the test that governs. In this particular case, this ordinance appears to me to be modeled on and tailored on the very ordinance that was found not to be preempted by federal labor law in Sage Hospitality. Um, it is uh, narrowly uh, tailored uh, to the specific goal of not disrupting service at the airport. So it's important to remember a couple things here. A, a labor peace agreement 
and which this ordinance talks about and is based upon, is not a collective bargaining agreement. It is not a card check agreement. It is nothing like that. You are not regulating the field of labor relations here. What you are doing is saying there needs to be a means to stop disruption, strikes, picketing, boycotting, things like that among contractors at the Philadelphia airport. And so the ordinance requires that that conduct be prohibited and requires that the parties have a means to resolve the dispute without those disruptions through binding arbitration. And that's all it says. That's all your ordinance says. It's, it's, it's defined narrowly. So, so this could be the parties get together and the parties find out, uh, you know, negotiate themselves a way to, to represent workers, uh, come up with a grievance procedure for discharged workers. It could be any number of things. The point is, for preemption, is that you don't dictate what it is. You just tell the parties to get together and don't disrupt the revenue flow. And that's all you do here. So you are not in the business here with this ordinance of regulating labor relations under federal labor law. This is uh, an important proprietary issue for the city, it seems to me. Um, there is a serious stream of revenue that, that goes to the city, the authority, and the city um, that is utilization-based. Um, it's not just here's a lease and here are, the, here are the payment terms under this lease. It's based on usage. It's based on utilization. The concession agreement, parking, uh, all sorts of concession agreements there that you receive money based on how many customers there are there, how the airport is utilized. If there are disruptions in that service through a series of running strikes, boycotts, picketing, those kind of issues, people are going to be less likely to utilize those concession concessionaires. They're going to be less likely, frankly, to utilize the Philadelphia International Airport. They, they'll try to go somewhere else if, if the airport gets that reputation. So what this is under Boston Harbor and under Sage Hospitality is you are, just like a private business would, you are protecting that revenue stream. You are trying to make sure that something that could compromise severely that revenue stream doesn't occur. And that's the sole purpose of your ordinance. You don't dictate what the parties do once they get together. So that's the first prong of the Sage Harbor test. The second is, is this ordinance narrowly tailored, specifically tailored to protect that proprietary interest? The cases cited by the solicitor's office, not only are they old, but they go beyond that. They regulate conduct. One of them, in one of them, uh, contractors who had problems in the private sector were barred from bidding on, from being awarded these kind of con uh, contracts. So you were regulating conduct that didn't relate to the government entity. You were, they were, not you were, they were penalizing these contractors for how they acted outside the governmental sphere. Or they were going too far with the ordinances they were passing and saying it is a collective bargaining agreement and here's what you're going to put in it. It is a card check agreement, and here's what you're going to put in it. So they were in the business then of penalizing contractors or regulating contractors. In this case, you have narrowly and specifically tailored your labor peace amendment agreement to reflect the proprietary interest that is permissible and not preempted by federal labor law. You don't, you're, you're, you're dealing with this site only. You're not dealing with conduct. Of, of these contractors outside the Philadelphia airport. You're not dealing with the employees of these contractors outside the Philadelphia airport. And again, with the narrow scope of the labor peace agreement, you're not saying what goes into, uh, into an agreement that's ultimately reached by the parties. So what you have done here successfully, in my view, we're very confident about it is that you have narrowly tailored your ordinance to protect your revenue stream and your proprietary interests. So in our view, while the solicitor's office waffled on whether this could or couldn't be preempted, and they couldn't say that it was, um, I'm here to tell you, in our belief, we're very confident that it's not preempted by federal labor law and it's completely permissible 
uh, under the law. Thank you for your testimony. You're welcome. Uh, Bianca Augustine? Yes. Thank you. State your name for the record and please proceed with your testimony. My name is Bianca Augustine and I am the Deputy Research Director for SEIU Local 32 BJ. Uh, good morning, Councilman Good and the other members of the Committee on Commerce and Economic Development. Uh, today I'd actually like to read a portion of the submission that I was sent to all of you earlier this week uh, by R.W. Mann Jr. He is an industry, uh, airline industry analyst, an aviation economist, um, and a former airline executive. Uh, he is commenting specifically on the labor peace agreement uh, that we are discussing today. Um, I have extra copies for any member of the committee who did not receive them earlier in the week, uh, so please let me know after. Um, labor peace agreements refer to compacts that are introduced with the intent to minimize the risk of service disruptions and lost revenue to contractors, to airports, and the air carriers employing them. I'm going to refer to them uh, now going forward as LPAs. LPAs modif modify National Labor Relations Board and National Mediation Board standards for employer and union conduct in an organizing campaign, streamlining arduous and legally complex NRLB and NMB electoral procedures and requiring non-confrontational resolution of labor disputes, thereby ensuring service continuity. The proposed Philadelphia International Airport LPA ordinance is similar to legislation presently in place or being debated in jurisdictions in 18 states. LPAs applicable to contractors and or concessionaires are in place at 13 large and medium hub airports currently. These include Seattle, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Ontario, San Jose, Long Beach, Phoenix, Chicago Midway, New York LaGuardia, New York Kennedy, Newark Liberty, Miami, and Fort Lauderdale Airport. And they are being debated in numerous other airports and jurisdictions, including right here in Philadelphia. Only three states, Tennessee, Louisiana, and Georgia, ban the adoption of LPA ordinances, although in Georgia, interestingly enough, Atlanta, Hartfield Jackson International Airport, which is the largest airport in the country by emplanements, has a labor harmony agreement in place. The Airports Council International, the preeminent airport management operations lobbying group, takes no position on LPAs and related matters, but they do offer a template for adoption by airport authorities. Uh, LPAs are also the subject of institutional objections from the American Legislative Exchange Coalition, commonly referred to by their acronym, ALEC, uh, which has for more than a decade championed its Labor Peace Agreement Preemption Act. The Airline Industry Lobbying Group, which I'm sure uh, has reached out to you, Airlines for America, and member American Airlines, which in December 2013 merged with U.S. Airways, now the dominant carrier here at Philadelphia Airport, argue in a general sense that less flexibility in the form of additional requirements imposed on them or their service contractors, including labor peace agreements imposed on ground handling service providers, could result in air carriers reducing mainline and regional feeder service at cities and in city pair markets, feeding the cities at which such requirements are imposed. A4A, Airlines for America, and its members take this position despite the fact that LPAs tend to minimize the risk of service disruptions and lost revenue to contractors and to the air carriers employing them. Philadelphia International Airport is a major hub as defined by the United States Federal Aviation Agency. U.S. Airways is the dominant air carrier operating both domestic and international hub out of Philadelphia Airport. U.S. Airways merged, uh, closed their merger with American Airlines on December 9th, 2013, but well before full integration of American and U.S. Airways. Uh, American and U.S. Airways combined operated as many as 486 daily mainline and regional flights in 142 markets out of Philadelphia. Uh, in addition, their international flag carrier code share partners in the One World Global Alliance operated additional daily flights and exchanged connecting traffic with both American and U.S. Airways in numerous additional international markets. U.S. Airways has stated that its Philadelphia hub was profitable before the merger 
merger with U.S. Airways. It is undoubtedly more so now and will be even more profitable post-completion of the American U.S. Airways integration. Since the merger, American has reported record quarterly and absolute profits and net margins. American is forecast to earn a record $4.1 billion in calendar year 2014 and a record $5.3 billion in calendar year 2015. A specific consequence of the merger and the eventual integration of flight operations in a single airline operating certificate scheduled for the second quarter of 2015, flight activity and seat capacity at Philadelphia International Airport are likely to increase, not decrease, as American and U.S. Airways combine networks, fleets, workforces, systems, customer loyalty programs, and traffic. Indeed, even prior to the merger, U.S. Airways had been investing heavily in targeted facility upgrades designed to accommodate increasing domestic and international flight activity, passengers, and specialty cargo. The state of industry consolidation, now only three dominant carriers, compared with the highly fragmented industry a decade or more ago, as well as uh, um, the combined American U.S. Airways competitive positioning, they are now the number one route network, surpassing both United and Delta, is far different than the fragmentation and desperation evident during the U.S. Airways bankruptcy era. In that era, Philadelphia was the beneficiary of the then bankrupt U.S. Airways decision to rationalize its network and consolidate its hub activity from among other airports, Pittsburgh and Baltimore. And the company, now merged with American, has continued to build on these decisions to Philadelphia's community's benefit. The present day Philadelphia hub dynamic is significantly different, better matching supply of seats with air travel demand, and is thus far more structurally vital than the moribund demand and oversupply state in which Pittsburgh found itself during the old U.S. Airways bankruptcy era. Americans, Philadelphia airport passenger and cargo markets and their feed are not portable or substitutable by other cities given the market's existing preference for Philadelphia logistics and the limited facilities, congestion, delays, and slot restrictions at American and U.S. Airways airports to the north and south of Philadelphia, such as JFK and Washington National. In addition to slot and use restrictions at DCA, American settlement with the U.S. Departments of Justice and Transportation precludes additional American Airlines or U.S. Airways flight activity at DCA. Further, DCA has flight distance perimeter rule restrictions that preclude other than a few exempt long haul operations. Finally, DCA has insufficient slack runaway or facilities capacity to absorb a modest, let alone a wholesale transfer of U.S. Airways flights operated out of Philadelphia International Airport. Apart from slot restrictions, JFK has one of the worst chronic flight delay problems in the nation, and attempting to add either feeder or mainline operations of the mag magnitude of U.S. Airways Philadelphia hub would drive the airport and the surrounding New York terminal area airspace to gridlock. American has attempted on several prior occasions to expand and improve the economics of its JFK hub, but has been unable to do so in the face of the larger scale and scope of Delta's and JetBlue's hubs and feed operations, as well as the itinerant operations of dozens of foreign flag airlines. No carrier dominates JFK to the extent U.S. Airways benefits from its dominance right here at Philadelphia International Airport. To conclude, labor peace agreements structured along the lines of the proposed City of Philadelphia statute are widely and increasingly deployed in jurisdictions nationally and at airports, reducing the risk of service disruptions and lost revenue to airports and air carriers utilizing these firm's services. Philadelphia Airport Management, as well as American Airlines Group's U.S. Airways Unit, the dominant airline at Philadelphia International Airport, would benefit from the minimization of risk of work stoppages, interruption, and risk to revenue that go with the adoption of labor peace agreements, which are highly unlikely to result in reduction in flights or in planements. 
the present consolidated, profitable, and foreseeably financially improving state of the airline industry creates an environment for success that is completely unlike and the near opposite of the fragmented and financially unsound environment in which the old U.S. Airways was unable to compete and ultimately reduce service at Pittsburgh and Baltimore, consolidation from which Philadelphia benefited. U.S. Airways has no practical ability or market opportunity to move or transfer flights from what is today a profitable Philadelphia hub to its next most proximate hub airports, JFK and DCA. There is virtually no realistic probability that, quote, Philadelphia could turn into another Pittsburgh. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for reading the testimony. Your testimony is on behalf, uh, reading on behalf of Robert Mann, uh, who is a national industry expert, uh, a host of clients, and has published on the issue. Uh, and so your testimony is that the bill is legally valid and is considered good public policy in many places. Yes. And that's your testimony as well, is legally valid and will withstand uh, federal preemption. Yes, it, it, it does not violate any federal preemption laws or any other component of the NLRA. And, like, and, and, and unlikely to directly impact U.S. Airways' decision to reduce uh, any sort of service or flights from Philadelphia is Thank the you. other part of his argument. Uh, let me note for the record that uh, Councilwoman Blondell Reynolds Brown and Councilman Kiana Johnson, members of the committee, are present as well. Any questions from members of the committee for this panel? Seeing none, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Our next panel is uh, Misha Williams and Anthony Reynolds. Good morning. Uh, please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Good morning. My name is Misha Williams. Can I hear you? Can you? Just pull the mic closer. Good morning. My name is Misha Williams. And I'll be telling you my testimony today. Up until last week, I worked for Prime Flight at the Philadelphia, Pennsylvania National Airport. I worked as a line queue supervisor for nearly six months at the airport. After, ha after having been outspoken advocate for better treatment on the job, I was term terminated from Ms. my Williams, job. Can you pull the mic a little bit closer? Thank you. I was terminated from my job just over a week ago. I have been speaking out for a union for prime flight workers at the airport for the past year because we need better wages and benefits and a voice on the job. A little over a month ago, 30 of my coworkers and Councilman Kenyatta Johnson went to the prime flight office to ask about the 1088 raise. That, <laughs> you got all day. that voters supported this spring, six months after the vote.
six months after the vote passed, <laughs> the wages hike, we yet to see a dime. I was proud to lead a delegation to Prime Flight office, although Prime Flight locked the doors and called the police on us. Excuse me. My coworkers and I remain committed to getting our messages across. Not long after the delegation, my manager called me into the office to deal with minor disagreements with another crime flight coworker. My manager proceeded to tell me that she was unhappy with me because I've been part of the delegation for higher wages. She accused me of trespassing and proceeded to tell me that the wages, that the wage increase and in union would be a bad thing. Quickly, it became, it became clear that I had not been called into the office because of disagreement with my coworker. I had been called into the office bullying, bullied into withdrawing my support for being treated for better treatment on the job. I stood my grounds about what I had done to stand up for higher wages and our, and our need for the union. Another week passed, the prime flight terminated me, claiming it was over the disagreement for the coworker. I feel that they target me because of the work with the union. I do not think I would have lost my job if I hadn't spoken up for my rights. This, this is not fair. Prime Flight should not be able to treat us this way. I like my job and I want it back, but I want it to be a good job where we can speak out for better treatment without fear of being fired for unjust reason. That's why I wanted to be here today. The bill will provide a way for addressing problems on the job before they become bigger. This could make a huge difference in my life. The, in the lives of my coworkers. We need your support. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Ms. Williams. I'm sorry that happened to you, and we're going to try to do something about that today. Uh, Mr. Reynolds? Uh, yes. My name is Anthony Reynolds. I'm a cabin cleaner working for Prospect at the Philadelphia International Airport. I work for the airport for nearly a year and make $8.50 an hour with no affordable benefits or sick days. I am part of a cleaning crew called MEC, which is Maximum Effort Cleaners. After passengers have deplaned, my coworkers and I come in and clean the plane from top to bottom. We clean the bathrooms, remove the trash, wipe down tray tables, dig in the seat cushions and underneath the seats. This is not the first time that I've appeared before you. About a month ago, I was here sharing my story about poor health and safety conditions at the airport that leave my coworkers and I exposed to potential infectious diseases. I spoke out a month ago because we want change at the airport. We want to see things improve for myself, my coworkers, and the passengers. How can we have a world-class city when we have an airport run by subcontractors who will compromise the health and safety of workers just to save a buck? My job isn't glamorous. My job isn't glamorous, but it doesn't have to be a low-road job. 
I am speaking out because we want to change it, the airport. I want to make things better. I had held out hope that the 1088 wage raise would have come through by now. Instead, we face another holiday season on poverty wages. I am 51 years old and I have five children. It absolutely kills me not to be able to give them what they want this time of year. My coworkers and I work hard every day. Our Thanksgiving tables should not be empty, but I fear that they may be. We fear that we will continue to struggle every day, not just holidays, in the conceivable future until we change things at PHL. My coworkers and I are at the point where we have little to lose. We've tried the polite way. We've passed out leaflets, held meetings, had delegations to the boss and rallies. Nothing has changed. And some airport workers have even been met with bullying, intimidation, and coercion from their employers. When the airport subcontractors refuse to listen to us and refuse to respond to our concerns, we may be forced to make, take more drastic action in the future. Our futures and our communities are worth fighting for. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you for standing up for your rights. Thank you. Uh, any questions or comments from the committee? Councilman Squilla? Yeah, I just have a, a comment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I just want to say, Mr. Reynolds and, and Ms. Williams, that um, we appreciate your courage to come in here and, and speak because uh, it speaks loudly to here, us here on the committee and, and to the city. And uh, I think it's important to hear all sides of this argument. So I, thank you. Yes, I want to go on, on the record as well to say thank you, and I salute your, your uh, courage, your, having a spine, if you will, to stand up, speak up, and speak out on what is a clear, obvious uh, injustice and inequity. At the bottom of the line, you, at, the, at the end of the day, the bottom line is you want what all of us want, wages so that we can take care, respectable wages so that we can take care of our families. Yeah. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. I agree with all that has been said. Um, we understand what that we're in a labor town. We thank you for your testimony. And certainly we support uh, the chairman of this committee, Councilman Good, who said we'll deal with it. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to also just acknowledge the courage of Mrs. Williams and uh, Mr. Reynolds for just offering their testimony. I, and I did participate um, in a rally and, and, and approached a couple of companies, one prom flight in particular, um, out at the airport um, with some of the workers. And I remember uh, the police officer approached me, and there was a pastor from Power who was there. And, you know, I kind of thought I was back on the corner of my neighborhood in Point Breeze because I haven't been approached by a police officer in a long time. Um, but because I don't live the way I, I used to live and I was standing on principle, I was able to um, conduct myself in a professional manner and express why we were out there for a good cause. And so um, I just want to commend um, all the individuals who are involved in making sure that change does come about. Um, one, regarding the wages out at the airport. Um, two, and when speaking of wages, I remember sending my staff a report that I received uh, last month on September the 24th, which um, showed that American Airlines made a profit of $1.5 billion during the second quarter of 2014. And so uh, I will continuously advocate um, for labor harmony uh, from, uh, from, from one from the city's perspective and making sure that um, all contractors and subcontractors at Philadelphia, Philadelphia International Airport sign labor, labor peace agreements with organizations representing or seeking to represent employees. I've been working very aggressively to help Unite here on reach these goals and I will continue um, working very aggressively with Mr. Chairman um, Good to make sure that this is a policy across the board, rather as hotel workers, rather as bag baggage handler workers, um, and so forth. And so um, if we're going to have a world-class city, a world-class airport, 
Um, you can't have a world-class airport without world-class paid workers. Because... <laughs> because, you know, ultimately, at the end of the day, the airline workers are the backbone that make the, the, the whole operation operate. No different than us council people have staff that, that stand behind us and make us do our job better. We understand that to have a world-class airport takes world-class paid workers. And so um, I'm here to be supportive of your efforts. And I always will say for the record, um, I've been um, serving as chairman of public, ta public transportation and public utilities um, since I became a council person. And so, um, you know, early on I dealt with this process and, and, and I made a commitment that um, I would address some issues that we didn't have a chance to address early on uh, when I served as chairman of transportation and public and public utilities, and that's making sure that as we move forward, those workers out at the airport are well taken care of. And so I just want to come and be supportive of my colleagues' legislation today for labor harmony. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Our next witness is James Terrell, Deputy Director of Aviation. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. James Tyrell, Deputy Director of Aviation at the airport. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the Committee on Commerce and Economic Development. My name is James Tyrell, the Deputy Director of Aviation for Property Management and Business Development for Philadelphia International Airport, and I appear before you to testify on Bill 140829. Mr. Chairman, as you know, Philadelphia International Airport is owned and operated by the City of Philadelphia. The airport is totally self-supporting and uses no, ta no local tax dollars. The airport relies primarily on fees paid by airlines, along with revenue generated from other business activities located at the airport, to pay all costs associated with the operations at the airport. Those payments from airlines are made pursuant to the terms of a use and lease agreement between the airport and each of its major airlines. Bill number 140829 would require a new airport use and lease agreement to contain provisions regarding how airlines could contract for ground handling services. The airlines would be contractually mandated to require each ground handler to secure a labor peace agreement with any union seeking to represent the employees of that ground handler. Labor peace agreements bring with them very real possibility of increased operating costs. Those increased operating costs would be absorbed by the airline contracting for the services provided by the ground handling companies. It is quite possible that as a result of these increased operating costs, there may be unintended consequences that arise. The use and lease agreement now in effect at the airport will expire June 30th, 2015. The airport is currently negotiating a new agreement that would become effective July 1st, 2015. As part of that new use and lease agreement, the airport anticipates airline approval of a significant amount of capital investment. That capital investment will be funded by the issuance of public debt secured by bonds. The use and lease agreement obligates the airlines to pay the airport for the debt service associated with the projects the airlines have approved. The airlines thus provide security to the bondholders and enable the airport to secure an advantageous rating on their bonds. New use and, le new use and lease agreements with the airlines effective July 1, 2015 are also the vehicle by which airline subcontractors will be required to comply with Philadelphia 21st century minimum wage and benefits standard law. Ground handling service providers will be required to pay all of their employees at least $12 per hour. <laughs> Airlines have indicated that the combination of the living wage with labor harmony requirements for contracted services 
may increase their operating costs to unprecedented levels. There are several, several smaller airlines that have recently initiated service at Philadelphia International Airport. Two of those airlines, Spirit and Frontier, both low-cost airlines, have publicly announced increased service levels at the airport beginning this spring. These low-cost airlines are greatly impacted by increased operating costs and rely heavily on contracted services provided by these ground handling companies. These low-cost airlines also offer competitive airfares that make Philadelphia International the airport of choice for so many travelers. Increased operating costs may have a direct impact on the level of service these low-cost airlines will provide to Philadelphia International. Operating costs influence whether these airlines will continue to serve Philadelphia International at existing levels, at increased levels in the future, or possibly at all. The airport's hub carrier, American Airlines, which includes the former U.S. Airways, is in the process of implementing its merger and planning its new operations right now. American made a commitment in its merger agreements to maintain its existing hub at Philadelphia International Airport. Operating cost at three of American's nine hubs, Dallas-Fort Worth, Phoenix, and Charlotte, are lower than those at Philadelphia. Dallas-Fort Worth is the largest American hub, and Charlotte is the lowest cost hub in American system. Charlotte is also the lowest cost hub in the world. Cost in New York, Los Angeles, Chicago, and Miami are higher than costs in Philadelphia, but they're also much larger hubs where many more passengers fly and generate higher per passenger revenues, making the cost incurred at those airports a little more palatable for the airlines. Of the nine American hubs, only Los Angeles now imposes a requirement for labor peace agreements applicable to companies providing ground handling services. New York and Miami have labor peace agreements requirements for retail concession operators, but not for ground handling service companies. Chicago, Dallas, Fort Worth, Phoenix, and Charlotte have no labor peace requirements whatsoever. This bill would add to the difficulties for an airline to operate in Philadelphia, making it as challenging as Los Angeles in that respect. However, Philadelphia International would remain the American hub with the fewest passengers paying fares American can use to offset such costs and make them palatable. If the increased operating costs resulting from labor peace requirements becomes a major concern for airlines operating at Philadelphia International, this bill could result in airlines not entering into a new use and lease agreement. Instead, airlines could choose to use such airport facilities as they may elect from time to time upon paying a fee that the city would set. The decision would prove disastrous for the airport for many reasons, including the undermining of the airport's bond rating, significantly increasing the cost of capital, limiting competition from low-cost air carriers who choose not to operate or limit operations to Philadelphia, and last, but certainly not least, jeopardizing the ability of the airlines to invest in future capital improvements at Philadelphia International. I greatly appreciate the opportunity to speak to you today about Bill Number 140829, and I will be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Tyrell, uh, for offering us a standard testimony citing potential unintended consequences uh, which always tells me that the administration doesn't like the piece of legislation uh, but can't prove that it's bad policy because it isn't. Yeah. Let me refocus you for a second. Uh, for the record, can you describe worker morale at the airport? I'm sorry, Councilman. Can you describe worker morale at the airport? Um, from what I see, the airport continues to be a, a very good place to work. Um, I've encountered... Um, Let me ask you a question. I wasn't really asking for a personal opinion. Yes. Uh, I was asking, have you surveyed airport workers about issues related to wages, benefits, and work rules? We have not. So how would you know? We have not done any official So you surveys. don't know? Correct. Okay. Uh, so airport workers might be frustrated and pissed off. 
Is that fair to say? I'm sorry, Councilman, I didn't hear it. I said airport workers might be frustrated and pissed off. Is that fair to say? Uh, it could be, yes. Okay, is that good for business? Absolutely not. How could it be good for business? How could it be good for business? Uh, it's not good for business. Because it's cheap labor. That's why it's good for business, right? <laughs> so should the workers take collective action? It's not a question for me to answer, Council. Are they legally entitled to take collective action? I believe they are. Okay. Have there been project labor agreements for the airport? I believe there are. Okay, so there are already project labor agreements for the airport? There have been project labor agreements. Okay, so who benefits agreements. from those project labor agreements? Uh, typically, they are a win-win for everybody. Which workers benefit from those project labor agreements? Do they include service workers? I honestly don't know, Councilman. Uh, the answer is no. You know the answer. So, so the next question is, are there different standards for different types of workers at the airport? I can't answer that question. The answer is yes, and you know the answer to that question. There's one rule for construction workers, other rules for service workers in terms of who gets taken care of. Is that not true? I don't know the answer to that question. Of course question, you counsel. do. Um, that would be a little bit more direct with you. Didn't council already tell you to put labor peace agreement in the next labor peace agreements, uh, provisions in the uh, lease agreement? I did, believe did, didn't Councilman Johnson send a letter signed by an overwhelming majority of council telling this council wants labor peace provisions in the next lease agreement? Uh, I believe the letter I received uh, had to do with the next concession management agreement. Uh, Councilman Johnson will be back with the letter. Uh, he sent it last spring. A majority of us signed the letter. Uh, but I also asked that question during budget hearings. Were you here with your boss then? I was, Councilman. Okay. And he didn't know about it then. The letter was sent to Ryan Cutler. Uh, so we already sent a letter to you it, telling again, you we want labor peace provisions within the lease agreement. Are you telling us no? The letter that I saw, Councilman, that was signed by all of, of Council um, referenced the concession management agreement. Okay. Let me ask you a better question. And this is the, the key question of the day. Uh, didn't U.S. Airways already agree to labor harmony provisions back in May 2013? I believe I saw a letter from U.S. Airways indicating that they had um, supported labor harmony agreements back this, in This is the letter right here. It's signed. It's in all the committee members' packets. Uh, they've already agreed to it. So why wouldn't you just put in a lease? They've already agreed to it. Totally contradicts your testimony. They already agreed to it in writing. But you came here and said it would be bad for the city and bad for the airport. But they already agreed to it. Councilman, I never said it would be bad for the city or bad for the airport. Yes, you did. Yes, you did. Yes, you did. I'm done. Any other questions from members of the committee? Councilman Brown. Good morning. Good morning, Councilwoman. In listening to your testimony, the one circle I drew around uh, your testimony was Let me find it. Where's this testimony? Um, last sentence in the second paragraph. It is quite possible that as a result of these anticipated increased operating costs, there may be many unintended consequences that arise. And so my question is, and it's somewhat redundant, but bears repeating, you tell us what some of those unintended consequences could be. Um, some of those unintended consequences could be less competition offered to the airport from specifically low-cost air carriers um, that rely heavily on contracted third-party services from the ground handling companies. Um, they also are more directly impacted by increased operating costs than some of the larger carriers um, because they operate on such a smaller margin. Um, so one of the unintended consequences could be 
less service offered to the airport from those specific low-cost carriers, such as a Spirit or a Frontier. And so you say could be, yet in testimony provided by R.W. Mann and Company, it states in their uh, paragraph, labor peace agreements are in widespread use at airports. So we know that there are some practices where already other cities have figured it out, and yet we're in a circumstance here in Philadelphia where there's been, and some might argue, a violation of what council has already made clear we expect to see. So help me reconcile with that. I'm not sure I understand the question, well, Council. We have evidence that labor peace agreements are real and do work in other cities. We have a document that, not the same mayor, that uh, Councilman Good, chairman of the committee, indicates, and Councilman Johnson is going to bring a copy so, so that it's clear. More than a majority of members of council, including those at this table, believe, understand, and fully support labor peace agreements. So if it's clear where council, council sits, and if we know that other cities have figured it out, I'm at a loss to understand why are we still having this conversation. Councilwoman, I was asked to come and provide testimony in response to the bill, and, and that's what I did. Uh, so philosophically then, let's, let's get a handle on where you are. If Council directs the airport to include labor peace agreements in the use and lease agreement, which has to come before you for approval, um, just like the concession management agreement, it will include that language in the use and lease agreement. Philosophically, where are you on this issue? I have no um, preference one way or another with respect to labor peace agreements. Where are you with re respect to respectable wages? Absolutely, Councilwoman. Thank you for your testimony. You're welcome. Um, before we go to Councilman Jones, did you write your own testimony? Yes, Councilman. Okay. Councilman Jones. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for uh, having these hearings, first of all. Um, I've been out to the airport not once, not twice, but six times over the last year to see conditions and to talk to workers and to hear that because they talked to us, there was retaliation really irks my nerves. Um, and that's number one. Number two, on Good Morning America today, they cited that the congestion at airports uh, was going to go up based over the next 10 years, the next decade, to Thanksgiving Day weekend travel level. Are you familiar with that? Yes, Councilman. So you agree with that prognostication that we are going to have greater demand for people who uh, carry people on transports or baggage handlers or uh, people who take people in wheelchairs or people who do those services that are at the airport. Uh, that is the heaviest travel holiday at the airport, yes. And, and we are projected to have those type of congestions every day. Second thing, we are currently expanding the airport to accommodate some of that new demand. That's correct, Council. And that how much are we talking about putting in capital improvements by way of that airport? What's the expansion plan? Uh, the capacity enhancement program is uh, targeted to cost a little over $6 billion over the next 15 to 20 years. So we're going to spend $6 billion with a B dollars, and I'll just, I'll save that for last. What was our current rating as an airport by way of satisfaction, time delays, things like that? What was the most recent? Uh, I believe the most recent, the airport had around the 75 percentile. So would you consider that a good rating? Better than it has been in the past, yes. Okay, and, and it's based on the backs of the people that work at that airport. So we, if we're getting greater demand, we're expanding on the capital side, do you think that labor peace is something we should plan for over the next decade? We should probably plan for labor peace. Yes, Councilman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any other questions for this witness? Seeing none, thank you very much.
Thank you. Uh, our next panel is Gabe Morgan, Danny Barter, Ernie Bristol. And let me note for the record also, we have written testimony uh, from Fred Wright in the form of a letter from ASME District Council 47. Gentlemen, please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. My name is Daniel Bowder, uh, representing the Philadelphia Council AFL CIO. Good morning. <clears throat> Good morning, uh, Mr. Chairman. My name is Ernie Bristow, um, here with 1199C. My name is Gabriel Morning. Morgan. I'm the Pennsylvania Director of the Service Employees International Union, Local 32, BJ. Whoever would like to go first, please proceed. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, the City of Philadelphia has a strong proprietary interest in protecting the substantial revenues it receives from the efficient operations of air carrier transportation at the Philadelphia International Airport and the volume of passenger, passenger employments at the airport. Pennsylvania's Bureau of Aviation reported in a 2011 study uh, that Philadelphia International Airport had generated $13.9 billion of economic output in the previous year. The airport is already a tremendous economic asset for our city and indeed the entire region and is projected to grow significantly. According to the Federal Aviation Administration, Philadelphia International Airport is projected to be among the th top three airports in terms of passenger traffic growth moving up from the 18th to 12th position nationally in 2030. The airport has the 10th largest airport operations in the country and is projected to remain so in coming decades. The Philadelphia Council AFL-CIO believes that it is important that our air carriers who lease airport terminal space from the city retain only those ground handling service contractors who have a proper labor peace agreement in effect. Ensuring the continuity of such services at the airport effectively protects the city against any loss of volume-based revenues the city receives from the airport operations by preventing labor disputes among these employees. The poor working conditions of contractor employees who perform ground handling services at the airport has elevated the risk of strikes, boycotts, and other forms of service disruptions due to labor disputes among these employees, which directly threatens the critical volume-based revenues the city receives from efficient operations at the airport. The Philadelphia Council AFL-CIO urges all Philadelphia City Council members to support and vote for passage of Bill Number 140829. The Philadelphia Council AFL-CIO will continue to support the efforts by city officials to encourage fair resolution to current labor disputes at the Philadelphia International Airport and to grant airport workers long-term job security. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Ms. Bristow. Yes, good morning. Um, I don't want to beat a dead horse here. Um, going to pretty much piggyback a little bit. There are major words here, labor peace. <coughs> we are in the city of brotherly love and, si and sisterly affection, am I correct? And what I've been getting from the testimonies of the, uh, the employees here is way beyond what I'm hearing. You have a high turnover being threatened, low salary and wages. I'm a proud delegate for uh, the hospital workers and over 10 years. And when you have conditions where the salaries of employees that are very low and can't get the proper materials to work in an environment where your health is in jeopardy, there's concerns when you have to go home to your family to say that you're robbing Peter to pay Paul. I, I believe I heard the Pope is coming. Did I hear that? <laughs> I think, I think um, and I'm sure the airports and in, in everywhere concerning uh, the Philadelphia area is going to be spotless. 
And I'm sure that the workers uh, that's going to be at the airport around the time the Pope comes, they are going to be the ones that are made to make sure that the airports are spotless. It's a sin and a shame that we are sitting here listening to human beings saying, don't be on welfare, but yet making $8.50 an hour. You might as well go work, not work, and go collect welfare, because you get a little bit more. But the bottom line is, we as union members, we are here to support. Uh, I, I, I see $1.4 billion. I'm sure the, the, the man that sat in the seat before me, his suit probably was a more than what some of our workers over here uh, make in a year. It's just ridiculous. We need to support one another. We need to pass. We need to, to, to do what all we can as support the powers to be. We need to do what all we can to help out our workers to make better salaries, not have to wear gloves where they have to clean, uh, clean a whole plane. I just got off U.S. Air, went to Vegas for a week, and I was treated very well by, very well by the employees there walking through the airport. And to hear that they have to, to succumb to the worst conditions at $8 and 50 cents an hour, barely able to support your children in 2014 in a city where we just opened up an ice skating ring, where your children can ice skate um, on the news showing that um, we are so well put together, but yet coming to the city, the workers are being uh, displaced, being treated unfairly, it's just a sin, and somebody's going to pay for that. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Morgan. In recent years, most airlines have adopted the practice of routinely contracting out many, if not most, of the jobs at the airline to the lowest bidder. This is part of the airline strategy to maximize profits and minimize responsibility for what happens to people providing services at the airports. This low bid contracting system has created a race to the bottom in which contractors uh, make their profits and airlines make their profits off of the backs of low wage workers. In the case of Philadelphia, well over 2,000 low wage workers who work the Philadelphia airport every day, earning poverty wages and benefits while providing services for some of the wealthiest corporations in the world at one of the nation's leading airports. These low wages and poor working conditions have elevated the risk of strikes and other worker disruptions at Philadelphia Airport due to labor disputes that have not been yet addressed. Recently, unrest at the Philadelphia International Airport has been mounted following concerns raised by workers over the adequacy of workplace protective safeguards and potential exposure to, protect, uh, to infectious diseases. Workers publicly expressed these concerns at a press conference at the airport in which some members of council attended on October 23rd in 2014. Similarly, at airports around the country, other workers have been coming together and identifying the same problems, uh, demanding a change, demanding better working conditions, a voice in the job. In fact, just this past month, similar workers went on strike at LaGuardia. In order to ensure efficient operations, we must have a mechanism for resolving labor disputes amongst airline contractor employees. A labor peace agreement can provide that mechanism and can provide against service disruptions, which are assuredly coming if dramatic change does not happen at the airport. A labor peace agreement simply requires the company to meet with a labor union who currently represents or is seeking to represent the company's employees and ensure that an agreement is in place which prohibits the union and employees from engaging in strikes or disrupting services. In exchange for such an agreement, there's usually some process of protocol for resolving labor disputes, the terms of which would be up to the company and the union to negotiate. If the employees have no union or are not seeking a union, then the labor peace requirement has no effect. A labor peace agreement is not a collective bargaining agreement that prescribes wages and benefits for the employees. It's not a card check agreement, which requires the company to recognize and bargain with the union based on the union producing union cards. 
A labor peace agreement does not require any employee to join or support a union. You've heard that such agreements exist around the country. They've been successful. Uh, there are labor peace agreements at major airports in Boston, Los Angeles, Miami. The real purpose of such an agreement for the city is to make sure that at a, at a place like this that's under, that brings so much into the city that any employer can guarantee that they won't provide, you know, there will not be disruption. So, I, you know, that's my, that's my written and submitted testimony. I would actually just like to say a couple of things to address the things people have heard here today. Um, the gentleman who spoke before us earlier talked about the unprecedented costs that the airlines are afraid that they would face and uh, if a labor peace agreement, which has no associated costs, is passed, or uh, when the wage is finally implemented that was voted on by the people of Philadelphia and passed by this council and uh, supposedly supported by the very administration that sent this gentleman in. I think that the concern that they have for unprecedented costs, though, in some ways is valid. Because if you've been able to exploit 3,000 people and keep them in poverty, for decades while you make billions of dollars in profits, you might get upset if something is gonna happen that would actually lead to those workers getting a decent wage. You might feel like it's a problem if those workers were given the power, took the power in their own hands to try and do something on their own behalf to lift their family out of poverty. You might think it's a problem if you know that the working conditions at the airport are terrible and that there are thousands of very upset workers there who are getting ready to take action, who want to take action to make a change because this corporation will not make a change, you might think that it's a problem to empower them. We do not think that that is a problem. We think that is a solution. But the problem at the Philadelphia airport is not uh, the unintended consequences uh, to the airlines. The problem is the unintended consequences of the airline's policy of keeping thousands of people in poverty and its unintended consequences on the city of Philadelphia. This legislation simply allows the city to guarantee that there would not be disruption at the airport. That's all it does. There is no associated cost with this legislation. Again, it's not a collective bargaining agreement. But there are going to be costs to the lack of such a thing being in place right now. There are costs that the city has already been bearing. In poverty, in workers' frustration, and so I think, well, the testimony I think that means the most that I think you guys have heard and have seen is really Anthony and Misha's testimony, right? And that's the experience that people are having at that airport every day. That's what's really happening to people. Um, and so the other thing I wanted to say and, and inform counsel of um, is that yesterday, a large group of those workers at Prime Flight decided that they're gonna go on strike at the airport tomorrow. They're doing that because they have been illegally intimidated, harassed for speaking up for their rights at work. When they've said, we need training, instead of getting training, they've been disciplined. When they said, we need a voice in the job, instead of people listening to them, they've been threatened and harassed. At a certain point, after you've been at a, a facility that we've seen grow in revenue by, I think, $30 million to the city over the past just three years, it's gone from $250 million in revenue to $297 million in revenue. Uh, at a facility where you are, you know you're providing services for the world's largest airline, the world's wealthiest airline, and you know that you are living in poverty, working full time with no benefits. You know that this council has gone to bat for you, has passed legislation, has sent letters, has demanded that the airlines do the right thing, that the administration do the right thing, that the people in the city have voted at the ballot box for them to get a wage increase. And yet all you find as a result of all that work is you're still in the same poverty, still being treated in the same way. At a certain point, you have to take action on your own. Yeah. And so tomorrow, workers at the airport are going on strike to demand the treatment that they deserve, to demand these contractors follow the law. And in fact, if this ordinance existed, if this ordinance existed, they wouldn't have to do that. And so we really urge you to pass this. We appreciate your support. Our union appreciates your support. I know the thousands of workers at the airport support. I really appreciate the support that this council has had for them and their struggle. And we hope that we'll see you out there with us tomorrow on the picket line. Yeah. Thank you.
Thank you for your testimony. The questions and comments from the committee. A, a salute to, to the, the leadership on, on this issue that um, in many ways uh, weakens our gut to think that, that other cities have figured it out. And thank you for providing the detail. Boston, Los Angeles, and Miami. Mm -hmm. Might you have any insight as to how long these labor peace agreements have been in place, the role of your organization in ensuring that this happened? Yeah, so for some places like Los Angeles, they've been in place for you know, a long time. Um, what's happening now is as people are looking around, as the airlines have essentially subcontracted all of their work and have sort of turned what used to be good jobs into you know, poverty jobs, right? Once upon a time working at the airport, pretty much people thought of as a good job, right? Um, those jobs, as the industry has changed, as the airlines have consolidated, as they've gotten richer, as their profits have gone up, um, and as they've subcontracted all of the work, that's leading to more and more disruptions at airports. Workers who are in poverty at some point are gonna take action, right? And so what's happening now is you're seeing this has been more recently adopted in most cities in Los Angeles uh, as these problems have continued to rise. So it's being considered, I think you guys have heard this in 15 states, uh, you know, the, lo the logic for it is the same as is here. It's ultimately, it's in the city's interest to have an airport that runs well, that doesn't have labor disruption, um, but it's been in the airline's interest to keep thousands of people in poverty, and at some point, the city has to put its interest over everyone else's. Mm -hmm. And I, I thank you for making the link, the connect to Philadelphia has a 26% poverty rate, right. yet we're not willing to, at least it has been demonstrated we're not willing to, to move the needle on something like a labor peace agreement, which begins to move people off that line. And so t too often we don't see how we're speaking with a forked tongue, that we want to eliminate poverty, yet we're not willing to do the right thing on a matter like this. I would say in a, in a city like Philadelphia, uh, in, in a country like America, where the majority of folks now work in the service sector, that is where the majority of the jobs are in the United States of America, and that's where the majority of the jobs are in Philadelphia. The largest employers in the world and in the United States are service sector employees. The same employers that are paying workers poverty wages at the airport, most of them are in fact national or multinational corporations. Even the contractors are national and multinational corporations. And so if you're really gonna do something about poverty in a city like Philadelphia, if you do not empower workers in the service sector to lift themselves out of poverty, then you cannot address poverty in a city like Philadelphia. If the majority of folks are gonna work in an industry where the majority of employers pay poverty wages despite making billions, uh, then you're always gonna have a problem. So the airport is a, an example uh, where the city has the ability, because it's, it's airport, to try and ensure that there are at least a set of ground rules yes. that work for the purposes of the taxpayers in the city and also enable workers to pull themselves out of poverty. Thank you very much for your important testimony. Thank you Thank all. You. Thank you. The next panel is from Power, Reverend Gregory Holston, Reverend Robin Heineke. Good morning, sir. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Reverend Gregory Holston, pastor of New Vision United Methodist Church and co-chair of Power's Economic Dignity Team and I will be speaking on behalf of Power today. Thank you for counsel for this uh, time to be able to share some of our concerns and some of our thoughts regarding this legislation. Power is Philadelphians organized to witness, empower, and rebuild. Um, Power is a faith-based organization that represents over 40 houses of faith, uh, approximately 35,000 individuals across the city of Philadelphia who are fighting for a city of opportunity that works for all. Power believes we cannot be a city where 40% of our children go to bed hungry every night. Power believes we cannot afford to be a city where 12.9% of our population lives in poverty, which is uh, deep poverty, which is less than $5,500 per year. Power believes that we cannot afford to be a city which has one of the highest infant mortality rates in the nation. Power believes that we 
even though we have a city with some of the best educational institutions in the world, we cannot afford to have a public educational system which is under attack and underfunded. Power believes we cannot afford to have an uh, overall poverty rate of 26.4%, which makes us uh, the highest level of poverty for the top 10 cities in the country. Power, um, power believes that for our city to truly prosper, all of us must prosper together. Power also understands that while we must have moral courage to make these kinds of changes, we also must have the financial revenues to make change possible. This is why today we stand in support of this bill for labor peace at our airport. Power knows and understands that this city must protect its revenues through, that come through the leases at the Philadelphia International Airport. Power knows these revenues are critical for Philadelphia to, to become the city of opportunity that works for all and, and to avoid any disruption in the revenue streams can cause devastating effects on our city services and programs. Power believes that the city of Philadelphia has a strong proprietary interest in protecting the substantial revenues it receives from the efficient operation of air carrier transportation at Philadelphia and the volume of passengers in planking at the airport. Here are just some of the statistics around the airport that shows the city's strong, important proprietary interests. According to creating the airport for the future, for our future, by a Mark E. Gallo, uh, 27 carriers provide over 600 flights to 125 cities daily at the airport. 59 international flights occur each day for 37 international destinations. 55% of the people that come there are origin or destination traffic. There are approximately 22,000 airport employees, and the airport supports over 141,000 jobs through 200 plus employers. The airport has an economic regional impact of $14 billion. And in 2012, the airport had 30.3 million passengers, 443,000 flight operations, and shipped almost 350,000 tons of cargo. The city receives millions of dollars uh, every year from the airport leases. Therefore, the city clearly has a proprietary interest at the airport. And as stated in the legislation, secondly, power believes that the poor working conditions of these contract employees who perform ground handling services at the airport has elevated the risk of strikes, boycotts, and other forms of service disruption, as you have just heard here today. Uh, due to labor disputes among these uh, employers who directly, uh, which directly threatens the critical volume-based revenues that the city receives from the efficient operating, uh, operation of the airport. The National Employment Law Project surveyed 200 ground handling service workers in 2013, and many, probably many of them are here today, and found these disturbing statistics. That most of the families reported making less than $16,000 a year in income. That nearly a third, uh, almost, excuse me, nearly 75% of workers reported trouble paying their, paying their bills. Almost a third of workers miss work because they couldn't afford the transportation costs just to go to the airport or to leave the airport. That more than one in five workers and their families went, went hungry sometime in last year because they just couldn't afford enough, uh, didn't have enough money to pay for food. 44% of the survey workers re reported not being fully paid or at all for time they worked before and after their shift last year. Nearly 29% of the workers reported not being paid time and a half or not being paid at all for their overtime work in the last year. 37% of them reported that they were instructed by their manager or supervisor to report tips that they did not receive. Of, of workers who work with equipment and surfaces, uh, containment with uh, bloody uh, or bodily fluids, only 14% of them reported they received training on how to protect themselves 
or others from exposure. These poor working conditions are, are, are the impetus for, for uh, some type of labor stoppage, some type of labor action, as you have already heard, is going to happen starting tomorrow. And this city cannot afford to be able to, uh, for the loss of revenues, the volume-based revenues that the airport provides by these work stoppages. So it's clear, poor working conditions lead to uh, work stoppages, lead to uh, block or loss revenue for the city and for all those involved. And just for the economic reasons alone, and I wanna emphasize that, there are a lot of the, uh, uh, concerns we have as people of faith about the moral concerns around the, the treatment of workers. But for this piece of legislation, our only concern is the economic loss to the city. And poor working conditions equal work stoppages, equal uh, loss revenue for the city, and the city with all of its economic problems, with all of its problems being able to take care of so many of the issues that are causing us not to be able to have a city of opportunity that works for all, we cannot afford to have poor wages, poor conditions, poor working conditions at the airport. No one in this city can afford this any longer. And I thank you for your time because power is standing for a city of opportunity that works for all. Thank you for your testimony, Reverend Holston. The Committee on Appropriations will begin uh, immediately following this hearing. We now move to our second bill, which has a little less testimony, uh, 140860, uh, Unite Here. Curtis Carrington, Anethea Woods, Rosalind Chinick. Good morning. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Good morning. My name is Curtis Carrington. My name is Curtis Carrington. I live at 812 Pleasant Road in Yaden. Please pull the mic a little bit closer. Okay. My name is Curtis Carrington. I live at 812 Pleasant Road in Yaden. I have been a banquet server at the Hyatt Penn's Landing for 14 years. I am testifying on Bill 140860. More than 10 years ago, the city decided to help Keating build my hotel. The city gave the hotel public land and gave the hotel public assistance. The hotel agreed to sign a labor peace agreement. Let me say that again. My hotel got public assistance. My hotel signed a labor peace agreement. This happened 15 years ago. It can and should happen again. I have walked the picket line, mar marched down Market Street and along Broad Street, and I will do whatever it takes to continue to provide for my family. Now there are rumors that Keating may sell the hotel. If the new owner brought in new management, we may need to stand up and fight to preserve what we have and keep our jobs but the hotel is still on city land. The city still gets money each year from the Hyatt lease. This ordinance will protect the city. It would make sure that the transition from Keating to a new owner would be smooth